is Lee Franklin, and as chair of the philosophy department, I'm very pleased to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Sally Hasslanger, the Ford Professor of Philosophy and Linguistics at MIT. In 2010, Dr. Hasslanger was honored as a distinguished woman philosopher by the Society for Women in Philosophy, and since 2015, she has been a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Before I say a bit more about Dr. Hasslanger's work, I want to thank the organizations who helped make her visit possible. They are Africana Studies, Women's, Gender, and Sexuality Studies, Hive, the Office of Multicultural Affairs, the Public Affairs Lecture Fund, New College House, and Weiss College House. Thank you very much. Also, I'd like to announce, yeah, thank, that's right. Uh, now, it's two quick things. First, please join us after the Common Hour in New College House, where there will be a reception, and we can continue the conversation that Dr. Hasslanger will begin. And in addition, we're very lucky Dr. Hasslanger will be giving a second talk this afternoon entitled, On Knowing What Matters. Uh, that talk will be from 4.30 to 6 p.m. in the Bonchak Lecture Hall of LSP, and all are invited to attend. How you conceive of something will shape what you will do to, with, or about it. This simple idea provides a frame through which to understand the significance of Dr. Hasslanger's work. The notion that human beings belong to fixed biological races long justified practices of slavery and oppression. Through groundbreaking work in metaphysics, Dr. Hasslinger argued that race and gender are essentially oppressive, socially constructed categories. Ours to create, they are equally ours to destroy, along with the injustice they involve. Dr. Hasslinger offers a similarly powerful reconstruel of racism and sexism. If we suppose that these forms of bigotry consist in beliefs, then we should expect them to be corrected by the force of evidence and reason. Experience shows that this is far from the case. When we understand racism and sexism as much deeper and more pervasive cultural phenomena as ideologies, we can understand why these forms of oppression cannot be cured by reason alone. And we can begin to think more fruitfully about how to overcome them. Hasslinger's work directly refutes entrenched views of philosophy itself, too views of it as esoteric or useless. Her philosophical reflection embodies and restores the original ancient conception of philosophy as a practice that can illuminate who we are, how we relate to each other, and how we should live. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Sally Hasslinger. Hello, welcome. I'm really honored that you're all here today. It is such a pleasure to have this great opportunity to speak to you about my work and I hope that it is illuminating. I hope that it does provide a glimpse of what philosophy can do. Okay, let's get going. My outline. I'm gonna talk about the puzzle of durable injustice. I'm going to then introduce a, a, an account of what might be responsible for this durable injustice in terms of ideology. This is an ideology, a view of ideology that has been promoted very recently by Tommy Shelby who's a scholar in philosophy and African-American studies at Harvard. I think that um, Shelby's view is, is compelling in so many ways, but I don't agree with it. I agree with little bits of it, but not the whole thing. And so I'm going to suggest that some challenges that an account of ideology must deal with, and then I'm gonna go on to suggest that his view doesn't deal with them very well. I'm then going to move to a different conception of ideology that I think does help us better in understanding the puzzle of durable injustice. I'm gonna apply it in the context of ideology critique and social change, and then I'm gonna wrap up. So, the puzzle of durable injustice. So, in spite of great gains since the 1960s, civil rights movement, et cetera, many social groups remain systematically and significantly disadvantaged. I hope that we won't have to argue about that. It seems very clear this is true um, of different races. Uh, the issue of gender and transgender is huge. Class, of course, remains a problem. Sexuality remains a, a source of disadvantage. But why, you might want to ask? Many of the legal barriers have been lifted. That's one of the great gains in the civil rights movement was to lift these legal barriers. Outright bigotry has declined. I mean, it was, it was as recently as a couple of years ago, just something that one didn't do, is just make outright racist remarks, for example. 
And so what is the source or explanation of the durable inequality and how can it be changed? What are we going to do, right? We, the civil rights movement was incredible. The feminist movement was incredible. We thought we had just made progress. We were going to put all this behind us, but we haven't put it behind us. So many people suggest that implicit bias is the explanation. It seems to provide a key ingredient in the explanation because not all discrimination is a matter of bigotry. It's not all conscious and explicit. Perception, thought, and action are substantially influenced by cognitive structures that are not normally evident to us. So for example, birds fly. Now that is a schema. It's a kind of, if you want, a stereotype about birds. And most of the time we get along just well, just, as, just fine. So when you're driving down the road and there's a bird in the middle of the road, you don't worry too much about slamming on the brakes because you assume the bird is going to fly. But notice, not all birds fly. So if you're in New Zealand or in Australia, where I spent the summer, and you think all birds fly and you don't slow down, there's some birds who can't fly, so you might run into them, right? That's a problem. Likewise, some of the cognitive structures and schemas that we, we rely on work pretty well in lots of circumstances, but in other circumstances, they're miserable, they're horrible. Now, we're not going to be able to get rid of these schemas that help us organize experience. Imagine if you couldn't go through life with general assumptions like birds fly, and you had to start from scratch every time. That would be impossible. So general um, cognitive mechanisms that enable us to take shortcuts are inevitable and essential to us, but we've got to be very careful about how we use them. And so this is what the people who rely on implicit bias think is the source of all of this durable inequality. So this is to further elaborate, explicit deliberation enters the process for deciding how to act quite late or only in special circumstances, if at all. So many times what we do is just react quickly on the basis of these schemas or stereotypes, and that is the problem. And oftentimes they're not susceptible to a lot of critical reflection because they're not even conscious to us. Okay, looks pretty good. I don't think it's good enough. So, although implicit bias certainly plays a role in this ongoing inequality, usually in implicit bias is attributed to individuals. But individual behavior does not by itself explain durable inequality because the durable inequality is systematic. So we can't just say, oh, look, Sally, she's got some biases. Oh, and Matt, he's got some biases. And Jane, she has some biases. So that's for the problem. Because that just doesn't explain the way in which it just persists in spite of conscious and very deliberate efforts to overcome it. Moreover, it isn't an accident that there are many individuals who share the same biases, right? So it's not just this random thing. The biases are pretty consistent across large populations of people. So we need an explanation of that as well. So well, how are we going to explain that? I'm going to turn to Shelby. So there are many kinds of and accounts of ideology. And I'm going to just represent two today. One is this cognitivist approach that is Shelby's. My view is a more Althusserian approach. You don't need to worry about that, but there's a philosopher named Althusser that I'm kind of big on, um, and we'll get into that shortly. So I'm going to use racism as an example. It's what Shelby uses as well. He argues that racism is fundamentally a type of ideology, and he offers this analysis. Ideology is a widely held set of loosely associated beliefs and implicit judgments that misrepresent significant social realities and that function through this distortion to bring about or perpetuate unjust social relations. So we have beliefs. Oh my, my, is it not? Oh, this is a tiny little dot. Okay, we have beliefs. That's what makes it cognitivist. The implicit judgments. That's cognitivist. So it's in the mind, in the head. Beliefs and judgments. Notice that there's an aspect of misrepresentation. So there's some kind of failure of knowledge or justification. And then there's going to be the perpetuation of injustice. So those are the crucial parts of the Shelby view. So why is ideology morally bad? He says, 
I want to suggest that the morally troubling feature of these beliefs and assumptions lies in their social function. They contribute to the production and reproduction of unjust social arrangements by concealing the fact that these arrangements are unjust. So what ideology does is it kind of filters our experience. It provides a mask or something um, in a way that based on false beliefs. So like the birds fly, maybe. Birds fly, that's a stereotype. We have false beliefs that makes us sometimes run over birds because you know we, don't, we think they're going to fly away and they don't. That's the kind of idea. So you have these false beliefs. They're not always explicit, not always conscious, but they guide your behavior. And then the poor birds, you run over them. So maybe it's something like that. OK, there are two dimensions of critique. The content justifies epistemic criticism. Their function justifies moral criticism. So what does he mean by epistemic criticism? That's criticism from the point of view of a knowledge uh, project, right? An inquiry that is seeking knowledge. So you say, look, the misrepresentation shows that this isn't a good way to get knowledge. And so you can critique it. You can say, look, there are all these false, unjustified, problematic beliefs that we have. And so that would be the epistemic criticism and the moral criticism and these bad beliefs promote injustice. OK. Now, how does he go about this? He says, well, if ideology is a matter of belief, ideology critique involves correcting flawed beliefs. How do you do it? Science and moral theory. So science. You do, you know, biology, does race exist? He thinks that the very idea that there are races is the linchpin, he says, of racism. That's a belief in races, is a linchpin of racism. So we've got to get rid of that belief, and science tells us, or at least the, the dominant uh, consensus on this is that races don't exist at the biological level. And then, this is John Rawls. He's a, a, a former professor at Harvard. Uh, now deceased, he wrote a book called The Theory of Justice. Really, really, really important book in the 20th century. And so Shelby says, look, remember that epistemic part of ideology about the flaws? We go to science, and we uh, find out that there are flaws. And we ask moral theorists. He himself likes Rawls the best, but there are other moral theorists who says, look, the, the structures that this ideology supports are flawed. They're unjust. That's how we do it. OK. Now, you want to ask, how does scientific criticism and moral theory really address durable inequality, right? Most of us philosophers and scientists spend our time you know, in our, at our laptops and in our labs and such like this. And there are many great and important discoveries that never reach the general public at all. And moreover, um, Critical theory has been saying for years that, that the philosophical insights should be emancipatory in some way. If we're really going to do good critical theory, it can't be just that it lives up in the ivory tower. It has to emancipate people in some way. How is it going to do that? Well, Shelby says this way. Were the cognitive failings of an ideology to become widely recognized and acknowledged, the relations of domination and exploitation that it serves to reinforce would, other things being equal, become less stable and amenable to reform. So the picture is this. In the academy, we figure things out, do science, do philosophy, we figure things out. Then we send our papers to the media or put it on Facebook or do whatever, widespread uh, acceptance of our results. And then maybe, you know, this just maybe, perhaps, become amenable to reform. I don't know about you, but I'm not waiting for that, right? That's not good enough. We need something. We're talking about major injustice happening, major injustice. Are you willing to wait for that long? I hope not. I hope not. OK, so what are some of the challenges for ideology critique? So here we've got ideologies, different ideologies, people living and working with different ideologies. There's a racist ideology, let's say, and a non-racist ideology, a sexist ideology and a non-sexist ideology. And we've got these two ideologies, and we need to critique, say, the racist ideology. So what are some of the challenges when we undertake that? 
The first is, in debates with another who fundamentally disagrees on moral and political issues, one seems to have two choices. One can draw on one's own moral or political framework, in which case the critique is not likely to be convincing. So I have family members who, I have to admit, are really racist, right? They're really racist, and their, their points of view differ very widely from mine. And I have talked to them at length about various things, drawing on my own assumptions, and we have gotten absolutely nowhere. This is the problem with this approach. Or one can draw on the other's moral political framework in which it's unlikely to recommend the changes one hopes for. So you jump into um, a racist point of view, and oftentimes you're not going to be able to get the kind of traction to get the social change you're looking for because their assumptions are supporting the status quo. Well, no, it's not so, you don't, your options aren't so good here, right? So what Shelby seems to say is, OK, go ask the philosophers. That will solve your problem. And you go, really? At best, that's just going to offer a third point of view that's going to come in. And then you're going to have you know, these three different points of view. And who's going to listen to the philosopher long enough to understand it? I'm sorry. I actually love philosophy. Don't, don't be put off by philosophy by what I say. I am a philosopher, OK? So I want you to listen to some philosophers anyway. So there's a second challenge that comes up when we're talking about critique. Epistemic, uh, episteme is the Greek word for knowledge, or one of them. Um, to unmask the illusions of those who endorse an entrenched sense of reality, one can't simply point to the facts. OK, so you might want to say, look, you're stuck in this ideology, and I'm going to come along and show you by pointing to the facts about all the problems with that ideology. Well, the problem is ideology works to constitute the facts that make it legitimate. Now, what do I mean by that? So ideology isn't just in the head. Ideology is lived out in the world. So women are actually overrepresented as caregivers. So if you say women are better caregivers than men, it's actually true. Women do the bulk of elder care, care for the disabled and the sick, care for the dependents of, of children. We have a lot more experience. We have a long tradition of women's virtues and women's socialization. In fact, women are overrepresented as caregivers. And so if you want to say something like, oh, no, women, you know, we shouldn't expect women to be caregivers, and someone says, oh, but women are better caregivers, you've got to go, well, that's right. You know? OK, what about this? Blacks are overrepresented in poverty. Now, this isn't by due, due to their nature. But it's still, it's still something that ideology has created. Ideology has created black poverty. Ideology has created women's caregiving work. And so when you're trying to resist ideology, the problem is, is that ideology makes the world in its own image. And that's a problem. It would seem that these sorts of claims are confirmed by science. So ooh, what are we going to do? If one's own approach is not supported by the facts, then what does support it? Just wishful thinking? If I just say, hey, well, you know, it would be good if women didn't do all the caregiving, right, maybe. Um, well, that sounds like wishful thinking to me. OK, so you might worry. What do we have besides the ordinary tools of rational discourse? We have empirical inquiry and in science. We have philosophical inquiry helping us with the normative problems. If you're not going to rely on that, what on earth are you going to rely on? Right? That's a problem, because we're talking about clashes of ideologies. Are you going to just go to war? That's what some people think. They think, well, if you can't rely on rational discourse, the only thing you have left is violence. That's not true. OK, but we'll come back to that. OK, against ideology as belief. I agree that racism, sexism, and such are ideological. I disagree with the cognitivist account of ideology and ideology, ideology critique as only a critique of beliefs. So I want to move us out of this focus on beliefs. An ideology involves beliefs, but A, it frames our experience of the world and the possibilities for action. 
So it's a kind of frame that makes available certain experiences and not others, and does primarily through our engagement in social practices. So this is the summary point. I'm going to say that ideology critique takes aim at both the frame and the practices. And they are prior, in a sense, to the belief. Because you're not going to get the belief without seeing that the experience is, is filtered by this frame. And it's filtered by the frame in order that we can cooperate in engaging in social practices. OK. Ideologies, as I think Shelby kind of says things that are closer to what I think, but, but he still remains a cognitivist. So he says, ideologies are not generally attributed to individuals, but to social groups, whole societies, or historical eras. The locus of ideology is common sense Notice that reservoir of background assumptions that agents draw on spontaneously as they engage in social intercourse. Now, he puts these assumptions as if there's this background set of beliefs that we rely on, but it's a lot more than that and different from that. We absorb through socialization not just a set of beliefs, but a language, a set of concepts, a responsiveness to particular features of things, and a set of social meanings. So look. Pink means girl and blue means boy, right? That's a social meaning, right? That's a social meaning so that when you see this on a baby, you don't, that just signals to you it's a girl. If you see this on a baby, that signals to you it's a boy. And it does so through this frame of concepts, of language, etc. Okay. It's implausible, moreover, that an ideology is so specific to man itself, it manifest itself in the same beliefs in each individual. Right? So you, you get the impression from Shelby and the cognitivists more generally that, OK, we're just, we all believe, all of us who are in the grip of an ideology, all believe that um, uh, women ought to be the caregivers. That's what we all believe. And so this is how we go on in life. But, Ideology can be very variable across a population. Plausibly, even both sides of a disagreement may be ideological. The claim that a particular action is or is not chaste or slutty or ghetto, I think, is ideological. So if you and I are arguing, is this lovely woman chaste? I don't know who she is. I just got her picture on, you know, on Google Images. But is she chaste or is she not chaste? You know, if we were, if we knew her, and we're trying to get back and forth about this. I think we're already in in the frame of an ideology because we think that chaste is the most important issue that we can address. We've already got the concept of chaste or slutty or ghetto, right? Why are we using those terms at all? Right? Maybe we ought to consider different ones, alternative ones. Moreover, an, an account of ideology needs to explain what it is for the ideology to be culturally shared, public, and dominant, and just saying, well, it's a bunch of beliefs. You go, well, right? But how did we end up with these false beliefs? If you're talking about truths, you can say, look, we're all converging on the truth. You know, if we all have a belief that there's a certain tower over here, right? How did we get that belief? Well, we all have seen the tower. Right? You don't need an explanation of that other than the fact that we've seen the tower. Or is it over there? I can't remember where it is. It's somewhere. Right? There's a little tower. But if it's a falsehood, right? how do you converge on falsehoods? Right? It's not like we've all seen the same thing because there's nothing there corresponding to it. So we need some kind of explanation. So let me turn now to the practice of ideology. So now I'm going to start to develop a little bit my own view. Ideology, on my view, frames our experience and possibility for action through engagement in social practices. So there are multiple social practices. This is a social practice that is common in some contexts, but less common here. Eating together, you know, uh, together out of the same bowls, sitting on the floor, or things like this. So in order to engage in a social practice with someone, you have to have certain expectations about what they're going to do as well. So if you go to have lunch with someone and the person sits on the floor, 
at the, you know, it's a cafe or something, you think, whoa, that's weird. You know, you, because you've already framed your expectations of that person's behavior in terms of a practice of sitting together at a table or a practice of eating with forks and knives or chopsticks or your hand or things like that. And so when we want to engage in practices together, we have expectations. But in order to get expectations going, we have to filter certain of the possible actions that we could take, certain act unless we're really going to spend a whole lot of time deliberating. You've got to see that certain actions are going to be kind of automatic. So when you came into this room, you didn't all come and sit up on the stage here, right? It, it probably never even occurred to you to come sit up here on the stage, right? Because you are familiar with the common practice, I mean, the, the, the ordinary practice of common hour or academic talks or things like this. You didn't have to think about it. You just followed the path that you were supposed to follow because you're engaged in the practice. You noticed where the chairs were, where the seats on the bleachers were, where the microphones were. This all made perfect sense to you the minute you walked in here. Right? Because in order to coordinate efficiently, this has become routine. All right, now imagine if it were the case that you came and said, okay, we're gonna do something in the, in the gym. And you don't know what we're doing, you come in, you're lost, right? Well, what are we doing? Where do I stand? Do I sit? Do things like that. So our social practices frame our experience and our possibilities for action. Practices in the normal case orient us collectively toward and distribute access to resources, which are roughly material things that are taken to have value. So at the moment, this practice of coming and sitting down and being so thoughtfully quiet and not uh, rushing the stage and things like that, there's an issue here about the distribution of time, the distribution of information, the distribution of, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And we have a practice in universities to organize that and coordinate so that the speaker gets up with a microphone and a screen and you all sit quietly and listen, right? That's the way we are distributing access to a particular set of resources. The ideological component of a particular practice I call a schema, and the interdependent schemas constitute a cultural techne. So the cultural techne of higher education, it's a set of schemas about whether it's permissible to take out a notepad and write notes while you're at a talk, whether it's permissible to have your cell phone ring, you know, those sorts of things. Those are different schemas, and together they put together in interdependent ways to create the norms of higher education. But, as you'll see, they also, things like this, constitute the norms of racism, right? How racism works. So, here's an example. An ear of corn can be viewed as something to eat, as a commodity to be sold, or as a religious symbol. Those are schemas. Food, symbol, commodity. The different schemas license different ways of experiencing and interacting with the corn. And the practices affect the corn. It might be cooked for food, or dried and hung in a prominent place to be worshipped, or the kernels might be removed to be shipped. These are different cultural techniques for interacting with the corn and with each other around the corn. What happens to it in turn influences the schema. If the corn crop comes to be incorporated into the biofuel industry, we may stop considering it to be food or as sacred. So there's a looping between how, you and how we culturally interpret certain things and the practices. As those practices change, then our understandings and our interpretations change as well. So there's a kind of looping here of the material circumstances and our cultural frames for it. Consider Akna. Akna performs a ritual with maize because this is a way to worship, and the practice constitutes her reason. She may believe that performing the ritual will have good effects and others will respect her, but even if these beliefs are false, she has reason to perform it. So the idea is, if she is brought up in the practice of using maize for a religious ritual, then this is who she is, this is what she does. Even if she goes to another country and nobody understands it, and people think she's weird, this is still who she is and what she does, right? She performs the ritual because that is a practice that she identifies with. Akna's performance of the ritual may be in some sense unthinking. She does it because this is what one does. This action may be constitutive of her role, her identity, 
and who she is. Now take, for example, a more familiar practice of promise keeping. Right? We are socialized, or at least we hope that people socialize their children to be promise keepers, right? Promise keepers in the sense that if you make a promise, you, unless you have a good excuse, will keep the promise. Okay, so this is a, a, a kind of technique, it's a kind of schema, a practice that we're involved in. And we're involved in, and notice that when you are a good promise keeper, you don't really think twice about breaking your promise, right? You might, it might be in your, so consider, suppose I say to my friend, I'll take you to the airport on Sunday morning. It's early Sunday morning. I wake up on Sunday morning, it's early. I think, oh man, I would much rather just sleep. But I've been well socialized as a moral being, right? So what do I do? I get up and I get in my car and I go take her to the airport, right? So this is, this is what one does. This is who I am. I don't stop to say, oh, maybe I won't do it today. Maybe my, pri who needs to keep a promise anyway, right? That's not who we are, right? And the same is true of lots and lots and lots of different, so the norms of academic life, the norms of, you know, being a fan of a sports team, right? This is what one does, this is who one is. So practices are prior to the behavior and states of mind of the participants. They provide a stage setting for action. They render our action meaningful and constitute our reasons. And I just gave you the promise keeping. Socialization is a messy process, right? When, when children are born, they don't know any of these norms. They don't know how to engage in these practices. Um, but it's a process of internalizing these schemas that enable us to be fluent in our social milieu. So think about social skills. Social skills is a kind of know-how for getting around in your culture. If you've ever traveled to another culture, you really notice, oh my God, I don't know what I'm doing, right? Because you haven't been socialized in their social skills. The messiness in social fragmentation, which is, is a problem in some ways, is a virtue in other ways, because it allows individuals to become critical of their local schemas and practices. So we're brought up in different families, in different religions, in different geographical locations. So the schemas are gonna be slightly different. The paradigm cases are gonna, the paradigm case of bird will be different. No, that's not the bad ideology, but it will be different in different places. So you can use the experience you have that's peculiar to your smaller group to critique what's going on across the broad cultural technique. So if racism is an ideology in this sense, then it's partly constitutive of social practices that give people reason to act in racist or racially segregating ways. Where to live, what music to listen to, what to wear, how to celebrate holidays or vacation, whom to frisk, whom to shoot, etc. So there is a cultural techne that has to do with racism. It's a way of seeing the world. It's a way of calling for action. Now, in the case of police, they actually go to a police academy to learn what matters and what doesn't matter, what, what is something that's dangerous and what's not dangerous. They learn to pick it up in, in split seconds, right? Now, you might want to say yes, but it's ideological. It's ideological because they've been given reason to act in ways that weren't explicitly racist, but when you look at what they're targeting or how they're kind of being responsive in the situation, they've developed a cultural techne that is highly problematic. The practices in, in question may also be constitutive of roles and identities, so it's no surprise when you start saying, oh, you can't do that anymore. It's like, you're keeping your promise. Oh, you can't do that anymore. You go, what? Or eating with a fork and knife or whatever, you know, or chopsticks. Oh, you can't do that anymore. You go, what? What are you saying? I can't do that anymore. This is, this is how I eat. This is, etc. So no wonder just trying to get people to believe a bunch of new things isn't going to solve the problem. Okay, how is ideology critiqued? I'm gonna look at social movements. I think the paradigm source for ideology critique is not philosophy or science, but social movements. They, not, they do sometimes refute false beliefs, but they also disrupt the very terms and concepts we use to understand the world. 
This happens by querying our language, playing with meanings, monkey wrenching, or otherwise shifting the material conditions that support our tutored dispositions. So, so monkey wrenching came from uh, an um, ecology movement that when in the Pacific Northwest, people were beginning to bulldoze prime forest, they threw monkey wrenches into the bulldozers and made the bulldozers break down. That was a way of doing it by changing the material conditions, right? That was an activist movement, direct action. But you can also do it by black is beautiful, right? When the civil rights movement, people were not just arguing for uh, changes in legislation. They were trying to play with meanings, queer our language. So queer is queering our language, queer. That's another example. The LGBTQ movement took over the derogatory term queer and said, we're queer, we're here, get used to it, right? That was a slogan of the LGBTQ movement and that queered our language. And so now we use that as a possibility for doing language in a different way. Effective social movements force our everyday concepts to break down by demonstrating how they serve as adequate tools. Another one that's recently been uh, important is, is the movement among feminists to re reappropriate the term slut. Slut tends to be used for um, women who are problematically promiscuous so that they become rapeable. And what some feminists have argued all along is no one is rapeable, no one is a slut. But it, some feminists have said, no, that's not working so well. Maybe we ought to reappropriate the term slut and say, a slut is someone who has autonomy in her sexual identity and isn't going to be told what to do by others, right? Now, you may or may not think that that's a good strategy, but what I'm suggesting, it's, it's the kind of strategy that social movements engage in. We create new experiences that highlight aspects of reality that were previous, previously obscured. They destabilize social coordination by strikes, movements, marches, etc. So the standard conventions or schemas are no longer a solution to how we're going to continue to coordinate. This may be through dis disruption of the material conditions. That was like the monkey wrenching, but there are other kinds of ways of doing it. It could even be strikes. Uh, appropriation of the linguistic or conceptual tools for different purposes, so they no longer have their coordinating function. Okay, the suggestion is not, it's important to note, it's not that we relinquish a commitment to nonviolence and rational discourse. Anything that you can do by rational discourse, do it. I'm not complaining that it is pointless, useless, etc. I'm just saying it's not enough. And I don't think we need to go all the way to violence to do something. To in, it's to insist that there are multiple ways to gain knowledge of social reality and the normative demands of justice, including experience. You, change, you don't just reason with people, you give them new experiences, experiences that are disruptive, which make it difficult for them to coordinate anymore. So they stop and rethink it. It's hard to have radically new experiences because ideology manages experience for us, but it's not impossible, right? Because of the ways in which um, ideologies are fragmented and confusing and we're always navigating them, it is possible to have new experience. So what we need is that experiential breaks that allow for and depend on the creation of new and potentially emancipatory concepts. So I think that concepts, I, I emphasize that right here because that's what philosophers mostly, mostly do. So this is something, new emancipatory concepts, better concepts, concepts that enable us to see things that we wouldn't otherwise have seen. Okay, attempting to change individuals who are socialized into a practice by engaging in debate about their actions is not just typically futile. So that's what the Shelby would be is, okay, bring in science and bring in this and that and have a debate and we'll see you know, who wins in the end. But it's futile because it rests on a confusion about the nature of social agency. Insofar as my action is called for by a practice, the pros and cons of this particular ch choice to act are set aside. So if I promised to take my friend to the airport and someone comes and says, hey, don't do that. That's going to be a total waste of time. Or, oh, you're exhausted. You should just sleep in. I bracket all of that. I say, no, those reasons don't count because I'm engaged in this practice. This is who I am. This is what I do. 
And so you don't. You, part of what being in a practice does is it enables us to coordinate by setting aside certain kinds of reasons and not taking those to be binding on us. The same as like doing your coursework or something. Hey, yeah, it would be fun to go out and have a drink and stay up all night, but no, fun isn't what I'm here for, right? Fun is not what I'm here for? Okay, that's the kind of idea. Okay, when we are fluent or unthinking in the social practices in our milieu, there seems to be no room for debate. So, we might, of course, question the practice as a whole. So, we might say, okay, 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 promising, that's good, but what about um, keg parties or something, in, you know, whatever. I don't know what your issues here. Some places there are big drinking issues. I'm not saying there are here, but you might want to say, wait a minute. Um, that whole practice that people are engaged in unthinkingly because they think it's the right thing to do because that's part of their identity as a college student, you say, well, let's just, they can't question it one by one, but let's question it as a whole. Let's find a way to question it as a whole. Questioning the practice as a whole is not something that individuals alone are in a good position to do. Why? Well, they may withdraw their commitment, but that doesn't usually, I may say, no, I'm not going to go any of those keg parties. I am done with that. That's not going to change the practice. And individuals who resist the practice are cast as rule breakers and resistance is punished. Okay, maybe not keg parties. They're maybe not, don't get rule breakers. They are the rule breakers. Anyway, but they, but there's a kind of rule break that if you try to go against the norms and go against the standards of your milieu, you're going to be punished real quick. If you try and go against sexism or racism in a highly sexist or racist community, you're going to get punished real quick. In order for a practice to be effectively questioned, whoops, there needs to be a social movement that challenges the practice and offers an alternative. Practices can change by providing disruptive experiences that force a shift in our conceptual repertoire, resisting everyday practice in public and systematic ways, bringing them to the surface so they might be critically evaluated, altering the material conditions that sustain the practices. So an interesting case, just a little anecdote, I hope I have time, curb cuts, <coughs> excuse me, curb cuts were uh, mandated by the ADA, passed in 1990. They made available all kinds of facilities to the mobility impaired um, so they could gain access to city hall, to public libraries, and such like that. They also made it the case that more disabled people were available in public spaces, so they were less freakish seeming because they were more familiar to us. Notice that since that time, there are more strollers that gain access to public places, and you know, there are more men pushing those strollers because it's become normalized, right? So here's a kind of fantastic example where no one had to intend what was going on, that the curb cuts and the ADA actually had a positive impact in combating sexism. So we ought to think about ways that we can form alliances across movements in order to get results that are good for everybody. So these modes are not usually a matter of reasoned engagement, but they need not be violent. Okay, here's my conclusion. Let's go back to the normative challenge. Remember the problem was, look, you've got these people on different sides, and whose framework are you going to use to criticize with each other, to argue with each other, and you can't win, that sort of thing? Well, ideology critique is not all about moral political debate but about making experiences possible that challenge common sense and motivate a change in our practices. Giving you a new experience. Taking, so sometimes I think about, I told you about my racist family members. Sometimes I think they just need to come to Boston and ride public transportation for a few days. You know, they, they live in central Texas. They don't have a lot of com, a contact and sort of friendly, easygoing, familiar, everyday contact with people of different races. You ride the T, which we call the subway in Boston, whoa, all kinds of people, the homeless, the bankers, the, the you know, workers, the construction workers, the academics, we're all slammed into the train together, right? And it's okay, and I think sometimes experience can make a huge difference. Critique won't, doesn't wholly rely on reasoning based on either one's own or the other's conceptual framework. It aims to destabilize the existing frameworks 
this critical distance does not occur on the, this is a quote from Iris Young, the critical distance that we're trying to find here does not occur on the basis of some previously discovered rational ideas of the good and the just. This is saying, look, when I argue, when I try to get my family members to break out of their ideology, it's not like, oh, I have these ideas of the good and the just and I'm going to try and implant them in them. No, what happens, the ideas of the good and the just arise from the desiring negation that action brings to what is given. So once you've had an experience of something that feels better, where people are getting along, say, coordinating on better terms, then you turn and you see, whoa, this other way of doing it is not so good. But that's not a matter of reasoned debate. Of course, whether such disruption will yield more apt concepts or just practices depends on the particular movement and the historical circumstances. Okay, ideology critique in the sense I've sketched challenges not only the truth or falsity of the beliefs, but about the terms used to describe the facts, about our concepts. And this is something that I think, for those of you who are familiar with standard epistemology, too much time is spent on truth and falsehood, which I believe are great, 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 great. But you can have the truths that are expect using concepts that are really bogus, right? We all know that. And so sometimes what you need to do is give up the concept, like the chaste and slutty and ghetto, those sorts of examples. Redescribing meat as the flesh of tortured animals or racial profiling as racial targeting matters. The language matters. It brings and highlights different aspects of the experience of the phenomenon. Hegemony both creates a world and a way of seeing a world, but the world created can be seen in different ways. And this is part of what ideology critique offers. We're not saying that you give up truth, but we're saying it matters how you see the truth, how you understand it, what blinders, you filters you use in gaining access to the truth. On the account I've sketched, reason debate is a good thing, but we should not, as academics or as citizens, let reason debate absorb all of our energy. We need science, we need moral political theory, we need cultural critique, and we need social movements. Let us reason together, let us share experiences, but most important, let us together shape new practices that embody social justice. Thank you. Hi, my name is Mark Harmon Vaught. I work in the dean's office. Mm -hmm. um, I'm curious how you define. Sure. I think you need to adjust the sure. mic. Sure. I'm curious how you define uh, social movement. If it's uh, defined by the nature or number of the individuals involved, or rather by the activities those individuals engage in. I would be. So the question is, how do you define a social movement? Um, social movements, and how do you? I think part of the question too is borders of social movements. They get kind of complicated. So the way I would, I would like to follow Charles Tilley, so one of the sociologists that I've been very influenced by, Charles Tilley, he has a book called Durable Inequality, I highly recommend it. But he's interested in um, moments of contention or claim making by a group that is, is unified by a kind of uh, set of concerns or complaints. It's not necessarily an identity. So men can be involved in the feminist movement, Right? Um, but it be, could become part of their identity to say I'm a feminist, but it's not as if you know, uh, and the, the civil rights movement wasn't around the identity of black, it was around a set of claims, a, a nature of a set of claims, and a contestation. So he uses the term contentious politics. So contentious politics is going to be when a group of people come together to make a claim against a particular cultural formation, a practice, or ultimately against the government. Does that help? Does that answer your question? I'm happy to do follow-ups. Yes. Hi, my name's Allison, and I'm a senior sociology major here. Awesome. Um, so I'm taking a class right now that's actually on like racial relations um, and ethnicity in the health field. So my question for you is, what about problems that are largely unacknowledged by the public? For instance, like racist biology is a like framework that's now being brought into light as like race has no biological backgrounds that's largely been disputed in our history. Um, but now scientists with the Genome Project are saying, look, like everybody's genome is the same. There's not a lot of variation with like people in the US. So like, how do you recommend like going about to change those sorts of ideologies that maybe aren't fully 
taken ground. So the the so so Tommy would be inclined to say that the belief that there are races is the linchpin, and so what we have to do is disrupt that belief. I don't really think that. I really am inclined to say, even though I agree that the that uh, racial biology is highly problematic, I'm inclined to say that belief follows practice. So, so if we start creating practices that are um, counter-racist, we might want to say, then belief will follow. So the idea is that what we believe, how we believe things and what we believe things, what we believe, is going to be shaped by what we need to pay attention to in order to coordinate, right? Because that's the, the underlying need, is for us to coordinate. And if it starts to be the case that you don't need to think about race when you're trying to coordinate with each other, then a certain kind of racial thinking will fall away, right? Now, of course, there's going to, realistically, it's going to be both, right? You need both, you need both the and, and not just one or just the other. But I'm trying to emphasize as a contrast to the cognitivist that says, let's get people to give up those beliefs, is how many white people have gone to dinner at a black family's home, right? Doesn't happen very often. This country is highly segregated, right? We don't, we don't share meals with each other in private spaces, right? We don't go to church with each other a lot, you know? We, we, don't, we don't overlap in our intimate and personal lives. We might have gotten to that point where we do that in our workplaces and maybe do that in our academic places, but in terms of really, really spending time, personal time, bringing people into your home and having them sit at your table. That's the kind of experience that I think that we need. All, much more, like much, 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 much more. And so, or, or going on vacation with a family of a different race. Doesn't happen, right? So what I'm suggesting is, you know, if we start changing social practices, and it's not going to be, okay, everybody tonight go home and invite a person of a different race to your dinner. You know, not, not, that's going to happen. But like in my neighborhood, I live in a, in a neighborhood of Cambridge that's highly integrated, and we have uh, the Area 4 Cafe, where our neighborhood's called Area 4. Don't ask. It's a complicated thing. But, and so it's a potluck, and we have once a month, we have a potluck, and all the people in the neighborhood come together and join food and sit around and talk. And again, breaking bread. It's not yet in, in person in people's homes. We haven't gone that far. But it takes slow steps to change social practices. Is that making sense? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Hello. Hi. Yeah, so I'm a government major. I'm a senior. And uh, uh, so I have two points uh, I want to make. Uh, I think I'm taking a political psychology class with uh, Professor Chuck. I don't know if he's here. Hopefully he's here. Hello, Professor um, Chuck. Yeah, so. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, so, um, so we've read this book uh, by Lodge and uh, Tabor, and their argument is kind of different from yours. They think beliefs and feelings, they're deeply like inward bodies. Like, we can't, like, the book's name is actually a rationalized voter, and it's, what it's saying is, say, um, this election, say you, so some people just don't like Hillary Clinton, and some people just don't like Donald Trump, right? And when you ask them why, why don't you like Hillary Clinton, they don't know. They, they kind of have this belief in their body, and they, they think about the knowledge. They rationalize like why, why I'm thinking this way. And back to the point of racism, I think, um, I mean, I I totally agree with you. Like when you ride on the Boston subway. If you see the minorities, like, and you can kind of change your 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 belief, but I just want to like point out that maybe it's not that easy to change. Maybe maybe it's it takes something else. Maybe like like I'm saying is this kind of feeling or belief is deep in totally. our society, and totally. and it's very very hard to change. Like a lot of students are left; they're not they're indifferent. Yeah, and you know. Just this kind of things, you know, um, I think takes something else. I mean, I, I don't think racism is, is, is something that we can't change. I mean, think about other countries. There are countries 
say in Europe, I mean, they have they have they have minorities too, but they're way better integrated. Like Ooh, from my subjective don't view. Don't go there. Let's not go there. Uh, you don't I have mean, to. You don't I'm have to. I'm just saying say it's not it's not like a radical thing. Like we can change it, but the matter is how we can change it. And I agree with you. Social movement, we can change it through social movement, this and that. But but deep down is is we're like the group difference. Like we, so we have I these differences. So I totally I think that what you're saying is totally consistent with what I'm saying. I'm saying move those bodies around differently if you want to change people's beliefs. Don't just talk at them, right? So if, I, if my beliefs and feelings are embodied, as, as you were suggesting, and, so, and they're deep, then what they do is they get reinforced. There's a kind of so-called confirmation bias because my body takes me in the places that feels comfortable and those ways and places that feel comfortable are going to confirm that this is the right way for my body to feel. If you take that person and you take them on a walk in a very different place, right, their body starts getting really stressed out. And, and so I know people I bring into my neighborhood, whoa, they don't like walking around in my neighborhood. And I say, no, let's just go walk the dog, right? And we do it. And then we talk about it, right? So there's talking too. But the body, the embodied practice, I think, over time is more effective in changing the person's beliefs than just talking to them. Yeah, I, I agree. And so I think I that what I'm saying is compatible with what you're saying. Okay. We need to form these practices that move our bodies around in different ways. That's why when professors, I don't know if you do it here, we move from having all the chairs and rows facing us to having a circle because conversation changes when we're looking at each other. We change a practice, we change the dynamics, we start to learn in different ways. You didn't, if you'd say, okay, now, all of you just keep your chairs where you are, but I want you to speak to each other, not just back and forth to me. Yeah, but. That's gonna be really hard, right? Yeah, back to the point of your, uh, your point of segregation, and I, I think it's difficult for, for, like, for this kind of exercise to, to execute, I mean, in this totally. country. You right have now. to do and, tiny baby steps. And, yeah, and the fact that, how polarized or government is, is I, I, I really can't see Don't how this. Don't trust the government to solve our problems. But it's, it's Look it's at Brown v. Possible. Board of Education, but, right? But like, I was, no, I'm as left as you can get. I'm so far left that I'm almost coming around, right? Right? All right. So, so um, All right. talk about liberal. Liberal, oh my God, no. I, don't ever call me a liberal. I'm so far left of liberal that, you know, Anyway, so, but I do think that part of the problem with the government is that it doesn't work until it works collaboratively with the people who actually are imbued with the culture. So look at Brown v. Board of Education, a great decision in 1954 to desegregate schools. Schools, nine, uh, seven years afterwards, no, nine years afterwards, in 1963, three states were still entirely segregated and some states, some communities had gotten rid of their public school systems entirely and put kids into private schools so they wouldn't have to integrate. Okay, why? The reason why is the culture hadn't changed. The, nor, the, the techne, the cultural techne hadn't changed. So you've got to be careful. I love judicial activism, believe me, I'm, you know, I'm a lefty, right? But, but judicial activism has to work with social movements. If it doesn't work with social movements in sync, nothing's going to happen. Anyway, I've gone on too long. I no. think that there are three more people, and we're running out of time for these sorts of questions. Four more minutes. Hello. Uh, so my name is Trexler Hearn. I'm a junior here. And mine is a kind of follow-up on that point with a lot of once you have a set idea, it's very hard for that to change in the person. But the next generation is extremely impressionable. So I just want you to touch very quickly on how we can kind of get rid of these traditional blocks that prevent Death. the next generation from. You gotta kill them. <laughs> just kidding. Just They're eventually gonna die, don't worry. They will. Yeah. You know, you can't, no, the, the, the first generation, yeah. I mean the generation of, of, of people who have these schemas very, very, very entrenched. There's only a limited amount. You can motivate them if you, like things like, um, uh, marry someone of the same sex. And then your parents go, whoa. 
and they change somewhat times, not always, but sometimes. So you do it, those yeah. new change. And kind of along the lines of just like institutions to prevent change from happening and changing those yeah. institutions, especially you, kind you, of in some of our education You demonstrate, you get and, out your, you demonstrate, okay. right? You, you say, look, I'm not waiting for the institution to change. I'm gonna go sit in the president's office. Excuse me, president, but no. <laughs> You know, that, those are things you do. You can do that. You can, you can actually have letter campaigns, petitions. You can, you know, march in the streets. That's how, I mean, they're, they're powerful. You got to be prepared to have fire hoses and dogs set on you, et cetera, you know. You, and in the seri most serious cases, people died, died for civil rights, right? And I think that we need to be, build a movement. And that's, I believe that Black Lives Matter is doing that. I believe, yes, all lives matter, but that doesn't deny that black lives matter, black lives do matter. And I think that that movement is a movement that's, it's moving toward trying to say, we're not gonna do this anymore on these terms. These are unacceptable terms to us. And I think I'm for it. Um, so I just want to start by saying thank you for coming. This has been an amazing talk, and it's been very fascinating to listen to. Um, my question is, a lot of the stuff about change that you've been talking about has been framed almost in a sense of, of movements of large groups, but in everyday life, we don't travel in these large social groups. Or, I mean, we do travel in groups, but we don't travel like in these groups that are focused on changing, um, changing society. Friends. So my question Get is... Get some social movement friends. Yeah, um, <laughs> all right. But my question is, what can we do, what can like the average college student do on a day-to-day -day basis to help um, work towards this cause of social justice? Well, I think you can start local. What are the issues of injustice here? Um, who, who cares? Call a meeting. Oh my God, social movement work is really tedious. I mean, believe me, there's interminable meetings and you know conflict and you've got to get around but anyway call a meeting get people together come up with a plan um, recruit allies who have some power uh, you know that's movement work that's movement work and you start local but also there are movements going on so you say black lives matter how do i help what can i do is there a way in which i can empower people here or wherever you are to connect with the larger movement so there so i do think or and there's, you know, pick your cause. Try to find who's working on that cause, both locally, locally and broadly. Connect with them, make friends with them so that you hang out with them a lot, and you don't, et cetera, et cetera. And then figure out what are the next steps. So I became a philosopher because I, I was an activist. I'm really bad at deciding what the next uh, action should be, right? How should, what should we do? I was always like, Let's think about it a little bit more. Maybe read something. And they're going, no, we're making the posters tonight. You've got to come. And go, oh, really? OK, so I, I can't tell you how to do activism, but there are people around who are in the midst of doing it. So hook yourself to their wagon, or hook your wagon to their horse. Anyway, you get what I'm saying. Thank you. Thank you.